Dr. Camille Kolu, thank you so much for joining me again on the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. <laughs> thank you for having me on. It's so nice to see you again. Indeed, uh, likewise. And uh, we've got, uh, we we're just talking about uh, uh, children sleeping. And, uh, and so we got a window of time here. So uh, I kind of want to get right into it. Um, I, I've uh, been really looking forward to this interview ever since we scheduled it. Uh, I guess where I'd like to start with is it's been a good couple of years. I think you first came on in like 2020 or 2021 or something like this. It's been a, it's been a long time. Uh, and that still is to this day, one of the most popular episodes, people comment about it when I meet people at conferences and things like that. Uh, and, and so, uh, I'm, I'm kind of like, why haven't we done this sooner? <laughs> All that to say, it's been a little bit. So why don't you just catch us up a little bit about uh, what's going on with you? What have, what have you been doing these days? Well, that's so nice of you to say, and it's nice to hear. Um, you put those things out there and you're never sure what's going to happen, right? But I, I've been doing a lot of sourdough bread, <laughs> a lot of field trips with my kids. They're five and almost three. And uh, the last one we took was to the Noosa factory. Have you had Noosa yogurt? No. It's an Australian style. And there is this amazing little factory about um, maybe 45 minutes from my house. And we got to see them milking the cows. I was just stunned to see all of these ongoing ascent measures for the cows. They have this little kickstand thing where if a cow, if a cow um, at any point revokes her consent, she just moves this little piece of equipment under, they stop milking, somebody can adjust it. Many, many little measures like that were set in place and they took so much pride describing them. It was so cool, it was so cool to see. I was with a BCBAD um, friend of mine who's also my cousin and we were just looking at each other over the cows, just amazed, so cool. So been doing a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, but, well, you <laughs> Did know, you mean you work? <laughs> well, you know, that, that's cool. I mean, uh, sounds like you found a way to, uh, you know, certainly tie that into the science of behavior for sure. And uh, it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm, so, I'm waiting to, I'm waiting for the part of the story where you ran up to them and, say, you know, let them know, you know, hey, do, do you know exactly how cool this is to see? But I don't know if that happened or not, but, uh, uh, or if they called security or who knows. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, uh, what, you recently published a, a, a I'll just say it, a, a brilliant paper uh, that oh, I, I've shared. You know, me. it's funny. I found myself reading it, and I'm like, so, and I had to do it the old school way. You know, I, I printed it out, uh, and I'll put a link to the uh, the paper in the show notes. And if other people uh, are going to take it on, I, I also recommend printing it out. And, marking it up make notes in the margins i was i was like taking pictures of of sections and sending it to uh to people i know i'm like oh this is really you know really cool um it, get it out of here a that remarkable is so work nice of scholarship so the the paper uh is called um providing buffers solving barriers value-driven policies and actions that protect clients and increases the chances of thriving tomorrow. So it's a, it's a, it's a very lofty title and, uh, and, and you back it up. So, um, again, I don't mean to o oversell it here, but it, I, I really, uh, was, was, was very impressed. Um, and so what, I guess my first question is, is we'll get into the content of the paper and I really love this concept of buffers. Uh, yeah, but I guess my first question about the paper itself is, you know, what, what was the, the, you know, I, I guess the most plain way I can state it is, was why did you write it? What was the, what was the missing piece in the literature that you felt this really large undertaking of scholarship uh, was necessary to fill? Well, you know what, I, I should have thought about your first question a little bit more out loud because it had a lot to do with that. So in the years since I've um, been on your podcast the first time, Matt, you know, I had another baby and I was actually, this is what led to the papers. I was struggling and I thought about whether I should mention this story or not. Sometimes I tell it in person. It's always a little more comfortable to do that because you can see people nodding or turning away or turning, getting turned off. But I think I'll go ahead and share it because some of your listeners could relate possibly. Um, 
I was struggling so hard. I was going through a little bit of like postpartum anxiety and depression and really hard things. And it was that moment I was, I was nursing my baby and I yelled at my two-year-old. I yelled at this beautiful little girl who was in there trying to like man for my attention, you know, in both inappropriate and appropriate ways. And I just, I just broke. It was so horrible and so hard to see this. What I, I was looking at myself kind of in a mirror thinking, I am being my worst version of myself right now. I'm literally, I, this is the worst I've ever been. And I'm doing it to my kids and I'm doing it with my kids. Um, to give you some perspective too, I was having to be up with the kid, the baby, about um, 12 times a night. I had moved into his room at night. We were, neither of us was sleeping. My poor little girl wasn't getting any attention. I hadn't exercised in probably 10 months to speak of. I wasn't eating because I was trying so hard to just do this, you know, being stuck in parenting at that stage where you think you might not make it till tomorrow. You know, that's how it was. And it was on the advice of a, a behavior analytic friend of mine to just get that baby a sleep consult. And I actually did. I reached out to somebody and I said, I'm a BCBAD, but I need help. I'm not sleeping. I am going. I, I, I hesitate to use all the words that I was thinking about myself at that time. And she gave me a sleep consult and I got him sleeping in a couple of weeks. And the person who did the consult was really familiar with therapies that a young or a, a young kid's mom would need. She got me a PT consult as well. And I started learning a couple of physical exercises that took away a lot of pain that I had from the birth. So I started exercising. I'm sleeping now. My two kids are sleeping. I'm feeling much better. I start eating a lot better because I'm sleeping and feeling a lot better. And at that moment, my relationship with my daughter changed. And so the now two-year-old and I are hanging out again. We're going to the farmer's market and everything. And around that time, I, I, I thought, oh my God, this is what I, this is what I'm reading about. <laughs> and so now let's kind of fast forward. Um, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, right? She wrote that beautiful book, The Deepest Well. And I think I've shared this part too, and I'll join these two stories in a second, but I was just struck by the behavioral possibilities in that book. But probably like many of the people listening and maybe yourself, Matt, I thought, okay, what does this mean? If this, so she lays out this theory and talks about these very research driven um, areas in which action could prevent the biological changes that take place when we are exposed to inescapable stressors, right? And if action prevents that harm from happening, why aren't we all doing it? We're behavioral. We can make, we can engineer the changes in environments that would make these behaviors happen. And so I, I just decided to do that for myself. And I walked through all the buffers. I put them all back in, in my own life. My life turned around. I'm feeling great, living my best life. And it, it's just so striking that all those possibilities are in one human being, you know, your worst version of yourself, your best version of yourself. And you can do that with someone else in their relationship and align their actions with their values. Because really, I think that's what it's all about. I knew what my values were. But I had such a hard time when I was under all that stress, living out actions that were consistent with that. And it really bothered me. And once I started seeing these concrete changes take place, I thought, okay, somehow I've got to get this story out to the masses. I need to start with my own people, right? Behavioral, behavior analysts are the people who listen right now. Some parents do. But I really wanted to figure out a way that would address what matters to us as behavior analysts and would address the key problems that they saw with a the theory. You know, there are some major barriers to us using this buffers idea. And so that's what I tried to do in the article is just address that stuff systematically, give us a starting point to see if we take this leap and apply Dr. Burke at Harris's work, where might we go? I see. I am grateful that you did share that story as personal as, as, as it might be, as difficult as it might be. Um, because I can guarantee that there are people who are, you know, who will listen to this, who will cer certainly relate. Obviously, I can't relate as a, you know, as a mom can, but you know, certainly as a as a father of three kids, the, you know, 
uh, any parent has their moments where they, you know, um, aren't, let's just put it to use your framing, aren't the best version of themselves. I, I like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'll keep that in mind next thing. Next time I have to apologize uh, to one of my kids. I'm sorry. I wasn't the best version of myself. Please um, do. It's lovely, uh, lovely to apologize. <laughs> um, that That's, that's great. And, you know, I, uh, I was talking with someone else who uh, is like a, you know, senior vice president in a in a large healthcare company, uh, and she had felt that her work life balance was getting skewed in the in, in all the wrong directions. And um, she actually hired a coach, uh, and one of her colleagues that helped her find the coach said, uh, "I think the acronym was like, well, what are your red behaviors like? You know, and mm. she, well, what's that?" rest exercise diet so at least it gets at some of those things certainly mm -hmm. there is uh more to that as you talk about in the uh, in the paper so let's let's get uh um let's get to that so i, I want to know what a buffer is and i also uh and we can kind of walk through those um but I, again I, I mentioned this a moment ago and i think it bears repeating the um the level of detail that you went into in terms of laying out this this whole idea uh, you know, it looked like the level of depth that you would see in like a graduate major area paper or something like that. Did it feel like that? Did it did it, did, it, did, did, did it have those grad school vibes, I suppose, when you were <laughs> writing it? Because the, the one of the things that I kept doing, it took me a long time to get through the paper, not because of anything uh, having to do with my reading fluency or anything like that, but I kept coming across a reference and like, Oh, that's interesting. Next thing you know, I'm flipping all the way back to the end. I'm like, okay, well, who said that? And you know, where was, you know, and then I'll go back and I'll read and like oh, some other interesting finding that, you know, Oh, well, who's, you know, and it, the, the paper is, you know, replete with all sorts of really, really interesting references. So I, I, uh, at a certain point I had to kind of let it go. It's like, okay, stop doing that. Cause you'll never get to the paper. Um, but it just seemed incredibly well sourced. Uh, and so I'm just curious what the experience was like pulling all those uh, uh, all those sources together from all these you know disparate areas of science too. You know, there's there's you know things of course from the behavior analytic, uh, you know, uh, I guess canon if you will, and then certainly there are things from neuroscience and everything else in between. So, um, can you talk a, before we get to the buffers itself? I'd, I'd I'd like to hear a little bit about how. How you marshaled all these resources? I mean, what was that process like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you for appreciating that piece of it. I, I, I do really appreciate your saying so. Um, I think it's really important to make this kind of concept accessible to behavior analysis, right? And I think Dr. Nadine Burke Harris and the people who've been working on this for a long time, like you know, the people doing the Kaiser studies on ACEs in the 1990s, those kinds of things, right? Those are not new. It's not really new information, but you can see that in our field, there is this hunger, especially among maybe people who are newer to the field. They're excited and attracted to the potential that we have, but you can see this hunger to be preventive. And yet this sort of dearth of resources to direct them to. I love this prevention paper. Um, my advisor, Dr. Shala Eli Rosales wrote a few years ago, the, the big four, um, how, it, how to be preventive by addressing functions before you need to um, address the function with a behavior of interest, right? Mm -hmm. But I wanted to take that idea of how do we be preventive? And I thought there is no way to tell the story with if we skip this important story about where it came from. This whole idea that there are adverse experiences that everybody faces. And that when you face those things, bad things happen biologically. And it's very consistent with the neuroscience research I had been seeing in the field, you know, the pathways that underlie that idea of learned helplessness or depression. Um, so that needed to be described for a behavior analytic audience, I felt right before saying, and this is something you can do about it. So kind of started by mapping out the different perspectives that we care about, behavior analysts and our clients, documenting how those relate to buffers. Um, for instance, you kind of see how it starts. We all care about human rights. You know, nearly every buffer taps into a worldwide health priority right now. And so I put a little bit of that in there. Um, second, 
we care about health, client and caregiver health. And each buffer is an area that potentially targets that health in a preventive way. Third, we all care about ethics. We have to. Um, and I've done a lot of personal and clinical work connecting ethics to documenting risks our clients face. And as you do that, you just see this big need to prevent harm, but in a concrete way. And I felt like this story could be told in a way that does connect the science of the brain to the biology of how behavior changes the brain and how that could prevent some of the harm that we're exposed to. And then you think about challenging behavior and all the ways that behavior analysts have already looked at these buffers. And so this one kind of, the reason that I expanded so much on that area, you know, for every single area of a buffer, I try to go through in the paper and document and describe what are the existing contributions of behavior analysts to this topic? And one reason I did that, Matt, is the question I get a lot from people who are interested in this stuff, they say, okay, this sounds really nice, but it's not in my scope of competence, right? It's not in my scope of practice. And I just wanted them to kind of remind themselves, yes, it is. Yes, we have been targeting relationship issues for 40 years. We have great wealth of literature on eating. Um, for almost every buffer, there is a behavior analytic specialty you can work on in graduate school or maybe apprentice yourself to a, a wonderful person who studies that and does that almost for a living. And so I, I have to credit my editor on that paper, Dr. John Guercio, who suggested that I group that into chunks and really talk about that behavioral literature a little bit more. And I, I hadn't encountered a lot of his work before, and I was so excited to kind of look up some of the neat stuff he's done because he worked on stimulus avoidance assessments before and how that relates to relaxation training. And I just think that's such a big missing area. Um, you know, we address preferences all the time, but we very rarely look systematically at what's wrong in someone's history that contributed um, to why they're not able to relax or whatever. So I was, I was really grateful to him for showing me some of that stuff. And once he um, made the suggestion editorially, the rest of the paper kind of came together. I scaled back on some of the other stuff I had put in there and um, just decided to focus on these buffers as a package. And then what it would take policy-wise, what I have seen companies do when they actually were able to get this in the behavior plan, work on it with caregivers, you know, start building that community connection. Um, so those were the things that I kind of bulleted out as I was thinking, what is this paper going to look like? And am I going to have to make four papers to just address it? Ultimately, maybe the answer is I should have, but I decided to put it all together. So if, if somebody wants to read this, um, they can. And it's in a policy issue of behavior analysis in practice. So I felt like you had to, you had to go there with policy and tie it all together. Well, I'm glad you uh, got connected with, uh, with John. He is an uh, as he's been on the podcast a couple of times, I've had a chance to uh, meet and hang out with him at uh, at conferences before, and he's just uh, incredibly smart and uh, very, very uh, can go very deep in the literature, as I'm sure you've yes. uh, you've you've come to learn. So, um, so let's you know, there's probably people in the audience like, all right, that's great, just get to the buffers. I want to learn. So, <laughs> what 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 uh, what are these buffers? And uh, if you can give us a maybe a thumbnail sketch of of each one as you, as you go through them. Okay. Yeah. Um. You know what? I'll start with exercise because uh, John actually turned me on to this wonderful book called Spark, which really connects uh, the science of exercise and how it changes the brain. Right. So I've been kind of collecting this, these ideas for a while, and I love making lists of all the neat books and uh, resources that the layperson could just find in a mess to understand these buffers. Um, but basically, kind of as Dr. Nadine Brooke Harris put it, a buffer is an area in which if we used focused behavioral action in that area, that area contributes as it's shown in the medical literature, okay? It contributes to preventing some of the biological harms that are caused by unavoidable, unpredictable stressors and aversive stimuli. And so she describes these six different areas. 
I'm going to say them not exactly in an acronym, but I'll do it in sort of a sing-songy way because I find this helps listeners to remember them. Relationship, nutrition, exercise, sleep, mental health, and stress relief. Relationship, nutrition, exercise, sleep, mental health, and stress relief. And so all of these areas are places that we might target in the behavior plan if something is going wrong, but they're not always addressed preventively as a group. And these are areas in which if you use specific actions, so for example, you've got a kid who's using a lot of unsafe behaviors and you don't look at these areas until there's a problem with one of them. You often find that, oh, okay, Maybe I should have preventatively looked to see, was he eating healthfully? Was he um, sleeping at night? Um, was he getting any physical activity? Does his caregiver know how to really help him with stress relief? How's his mental health, right? And so if you look at all those things preventively, we do a lot of wonderful work in terms of preventing a lot of those downstream biological harms. And we haven't mentioned this yet, but the evidence shows that those biological harms are dose dependent. And so the more adverse experiences we go through, the worse those outcomes are medically for us. You know, kids get diseases that adults get, you have early onset of things, you have more inflammation. And in the paper, I, I do give a lot of references and a table that goes over a few of those. And so it's not in my scope and it's certainly not in my training to talk about the medical um, impacts. However, we are obligated ethically to rule out or to document the impacts of medical impacts on, um, on behaviors that we're treating, right? And so it does make sense ethically for us to look at these six areas in just a preventive or a proactive, I should say, a proactive way. I see. Yeah. So that, that's a that's a good point about it. You know, these stressors impacting people, you know, physiologically uh, earlier on in life. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, my day job is uh, school consultation, and I um, have the 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 opportunity and to support a lot of communities, and uh, a lot of the communities I work in are. Um, very disadvantaged communities. And, you know, so when you meet with like IEP teams and thing, uh, and other kind of community stakeholders, a, a lot, uh, particularly those, uh, families who have been through a lot, you know, uh, we'll just kind of, you know, leave it at that to fill, you know, people can fill in the blanks that sometimes there is, a, you know, uh, people might look advanced, advanced, like physiologically in their, in their age because they've had, yeah. you know, um, um, a difficult path to, to, to follow in life. So I totally, totally can see that. Um, so I, I take your point that some of these buffers are, you know, behavior analysts might have some confidence in at least examining some of these buffers. I think things like sleep and nutrition and exercise are uh, at least measurable, countable things. Um, I'm curious though, with some of the fuzzier ones, if you will, or at least I'm calling them that, you know, things like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, nurturing relationships, you know, so, you know, people might say, well, what does that mean to have a nurturing relationship, uh, mental health, stress reduction, um, you know, those things are a little more difficult to quantify, uh, um, yeah. or at least that's my, I guess, claim, if you will, I, I'm, I'm curious what your response might be to, to someone who might be like, yeah, that sounds great. And that sounds super, very, very important. And, um, and, I'm struggling to kind of operationalize that in, in a way that uh, I can I can make a difference or move the needle. So how would you, how would you respond to someone who uh, might might have that apprehension? I love that question, and it's so true, right? Um, I mean, on the one hand, you can look at one of the fuzzy buffers, and Matt, I'm going to credit you. I'm going to call them the three hard buffers and the three fuzzy buffers because that makes so much sense to me visually. <laughs> as I picture them, it is warm and fuzzy to address relationships and mental health and stress relief. So on the one hand, um, I do describe some of the literature in terms of relationship and how we have targeted that in behavior and an analysis in the past, right? But if you think about it, 
you know, uh, okay, there is a lot of good, good work on improving social skills and caregiver relationships with their children. And um, the kind of work that we do in parent training, for example, and peer, um, all the peer studies and that lovely stuff and rapport. But thinking about rapport, that sort of highlights the problem because haven't we often been so transactional with how we teach rapport and why we teach rapport and why we use rapport and so utilitarian, right? Um, I'm going to put just a, a few names for um, the things we do in, in the nurturing relationship. Um, I'll talk about those a little bit in terms of what we have in the paper, but then I want to go further and give you sort of a way to do this in terms of the buffers themselves. Um, I think the first idea from the paper and something I want everybody to always do is try not to hurt. You know, it sounds really obvious, but we have to honor the relationships that already exist for our client or for our caregivers or for our staff. And so, so often we're accidentally inadvertently creating this environment that's almost making it harder for them to interact with the ones that they loved. Um, almost making work seem so attractive that they're doing less of what they love and more work and, you know, just kind of taking away from the one thing maybe we should be fostering or helping to flourish. And so that's important, right, is be sure that nothing we do interferes with the relationships that others value, at least if they're nurturing relationships. Um, another piece that will be familiar to people with the ethics code is just clarifying roles and boundaries and using really clear communication about what your relationship is, the nature of that. And then this idea that uh, Roger Amon et al. comes up with and talks about establishing ourselves as safety signals, maybe reestablishing ourselves as safety signals. Well, that's an important thing that a lot of caregivers need help with. They need to know, how do I repair my relationship with my, my child who I maybe gave a lot of support on that I thought was supportive and they didn't take it that way, right? Um, with this kind of tidal wave of understanding that some of the practices we've been using have been experienced differently as we intended. So maybe they've been harmful or hurtful on the receiving end. How do we reestablish ourselves as safe people? And so I think that all is, is really important, right? But I'm going to switch from the relationship buffer for a second and tell you about how I'm thinking about the mental health buffer, because I truly think you can kind of use one as a lens to approach the other. So okay. thinking about the mental health buffer in my paper and in a lot of the work, it's very reductive. You know, we're thinking about mental health as the absence of mental illness. I would venture to say most of us in behavior analysis, at least, we're not positive psychologists, right? We're not thinking about the opt optimism literature for what mental health is. We're all thinking, okay, well, I want to do preventive visits with his mental health provider or their therapist, and they're on the schedule. Great. Mental health is taken care of. But that's not it, right? That's just a teeny tiny part of it. And it's not even necessarily true. I think we have to open up and give people permission to exist in this place where it's okay to have a mental illness and also to be experiencing wonderful aspects of mental health. These things can both be true, right? Many of us are living with anxiety or something like that. Many of us have definitions or labels applied to us and maybe we have an aspect of suffering that we're going through. But if you have also layer on what mental health is to the person, Okay, so it, it's not just the absence of something negative, quote unquote, what is it? And so if you look at that literature, and there's some really neat little studies that are more recent, um, it's PERMA, it's this acronym, um, P is for positive emotions, um, engagement and things you love, relationships, finding meaning and experiencing achievement. And so those five things, now for a second, use that idea, right? About defining what does it look like if, if my client is actually healthy mentally? Can you apply that to relationship, to the nurturing relationship? I think you can. So what would it be like if um, 
I was doing and saying and thinking and exploring and tasting and hearing the things with my partner that make us both experience positive emotions, right? Or that make us feel engaged or um, that allow us to experience meaning together or shared achievement, right? And so I love that idea. And this is sort of an innovation on the model that I presented in the paper because you know, you do a lot of work for three or four years and then you start doing more and you can't pack it all into something you already submitted. So this is sort of where it's going now, right? Is huge expansion in the mental health buffer and the stress relief buffer. But yeah, um, I, I wonder if that explanation, Matt, does that kind of help you see this if it's more concrete as things we could do? Uh, it, it does. I, I guess I have a couple of thoughts. One, one is um, I, I like the notion of helping people expand their repertoires to find more enjoyable things to do in their lives. Uh, certainly. Uh, um, and I also like the idea of, um, yeah, I don't know, this is an apt metaphor, but you know, if, if the, whatever aspect of the suffering that you, you know, like those examples that you described is, is, you know, uh, if that's, if you were to, you know, somehow, uh, measure that, uh, and it's part of the pie chart of one's life. It sounds like the, the the goal then is to expand the pie. We might not reduce the size of the slice that is the suffering, but oh, rather yes. increase the size of the pie. So proportionally, the uh, the suffering is less representative of the whole. But um, yeah, that 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 that's that's uh, that that's really interesting. And certainly, uh, teaching new repertoires is you know within the purview of uh, behavior anal uh, analysis, I hope. So um, that that's, that's, you know, this is very aspirational, I, I suppose, you know, and I, I think that's one of the things that is, uh, uh, makes this such an interesting concept to, to wrestle with. Um, so I, uh, for just from a, from a philosophical standpoint, this is, the, um, I, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly a, a, a new perspective for me. Um, um, I want to uh, come back. You mentioned it really briefly. Um, uh, the whole notion of of learned helplessness. You devoted a, a you know I think a good couple of paragraphs to that uh, topic. Um, what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, if if you give people a reminder of of obviously there's been a you know like fifty years of research on it certainly. Um, so, uh, I was going to say, can you give a brief description of it, of, of something that's been studied for decades and decades, but if you can give kind of like a thumbnail sketch of, of learn helplessness, learn helplessness, excuse me. And then, um, you know, tell us why you felt that was important to include in the, in the paper. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I don't mind that it's aspirational. You know, I, I realize that is a problem. It means this is not something that's, on the one hand, it's not something that's easily downloaded and regurgitated and, you know, done with everybody. On the other hand, it is because wherever you start, you know, if you want to try to apply some of the buffers with your client. You want to look through their behavior plan and see, hey, are these things in there? Um, are we addressing them preventively? That's doable for everybody, right? Um, the other stuff, you know, meaning, achievement, great nurturing relationships. Yeah, that may take a little while. That's okay. You know, do you want to expand your repertoires or don't you, you know, um, expand boundaries of confidence, right? So yes, it is expansive and it's going to require a little bit of work. The third fuzzy buffer, if you will, was stress relief. Mm. And people generally talk about that one as mindfulness, ways to bring your stress under control, maybe doing yoga. But I want to talk about it, and I wanted to in the paper too. This is why I brought it up in the paper. I wanted to talk about it in terms of the learned helplessness research, because I think that that research gives us two very specific, very doable, very behavioral things that will do the this, this stress buffer for us. Um, Sometimes I call this the behavioral buffer, in fact, because I think it's the one most amenable to making the kind of changes and behavior plans that make a huge difference for my clients. And I can give you an example in a minute. Um, but OK, uh, the basic idea of learned helplessness is 
Basically, we're exposed to uncontrollable stress, and when we do, we shut down and we learn to be helpless. So that idea has its roots in experiments that were done, like you mentioned, 50 years ago. Interestingly, I live, and I can kind of see Boulder, uh, Colorado from here, I live very close, and I haven't met him in person. Um, but I live very close to the person who did those experiments, Dr. Steve Meyer. He's over there at um, one of the universities in Boulder. But he worked with Marty Seligman, who did a lot of the work in psychology that led to optimism and positive um, psychology movement, which is not as warm and fuzzy as it sounds. And so uh, the new neuroscience uh, since that time has really focused on a, elucidating what are those pathways that underlie learned helplessness and what Seligman and Meyer have just published about, um, I don't know, maybe five or six, maybe more uh, years ago now in their retrospective of learned helplessness 50 years later, right? Mm -hmm. They found that they got it wrong, right? It wasn't that we learn helplessness, it's that that's the default if we're not learning to control our environment. If we are, then you can't call it an uncontrollable stressor anymore, can you? And so the thing is, we're not learning to be helpless. That's just the default pattern taking place. That helpless pattern, that laying down and not moving is accomplished by this pathway um, that ends up causing all of this biological damage. Right. So if you wanted to prevent all this biological damage that is a result of facing uncontro uncontrollable stressors, what you have to do instead, and I'm going to use some um, colloquial terms, what you have to do instead is detect or predict and um, control the stressor. But I think that's very easily discussed in terms of behavior analysis. We could talk about it in terms of making an observing response right? Noting the aspects of the stimulus complex. Is it salient? You know, is there a CS related to it that you end up seeing in the environment, right? Um, what, what's the discriminative stimulus? Whatever it is about the stressor that you can detect, you make an observing response to that, and then the organism has to make some kind of differential response to the stressor. Maybe it's some kind of behavioral control. Maybe they can turn down the stressor a little bit, or maybe ask for help in the middle of it, or use a skill that they've practiced earlier to calm themselves down or to keep breathing during the stressor. Um, the point is, what we know now is that when we face a stressor, if we exert behavioral control about it or over the situation, we don't have learned helplessness happen. And that pathway is totally different now. Those biological changes don't happen now. And so the stress relief buffer is so important because it literally is a way to control stressors, it literally mm -hmm. controls the outcome of the stress as well on the body. But it's also very, very doable behaviorally. So when I have a behavior plan, um, I often give this example that's a real example and replicated across a ton of my clients. Every single time I have a client, we do this. Figure out what are they stressed about? What hard difficult, unpredictable things are going to happen next week. How are we going to predict them? How are we going to cue the caregivers to be ready to uh, pre-cue and prime the kind of skills that will be helpful, right? And how are we going to reinforce those things early in the repertoire to make sure that she's fluent and ready when she needs them? And so, again, you could think about it in terms of those cognitive terms, prediction and control but it's also very behavioral. Good stuff. That's, that's super cool. Uh, I'm glad you took the, uh, the page, I know page space is a commodity in uh, journals. So I'm, uh, I'm glad that, uh, sure. that you guys were able to fit that in but, you know, between your, your interactions with John about that. Um, I want to turn to so you, 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 so the, the paper goes on and kind of, uh, uh, frames this up in in what you're uh, calling the uh, the the butterflies tool. So uh, I want to give you an opportunity to to describe what you mean by that. Uh, and I know you have some um, 
some trainings on this and, and, and so forth as well, I believe. Um, so I want to have, give you the opportunity to talk about the, the tool itself and um, how that fits in the, in the context of, I guess, this very broad foundation that you just laid. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, I think one of the great questions I get from people, and I, I always make a tool in response to a set of really great questions, because I know that I won't be there to answer the question after the workshop or after the parent training. And so I want to operationalize the question with its answer in such a way that the person could take it and use it when I'm not there. And so this is kind of an attempt to do that. So one of the great questions that always comes up is not only is this in my scope of competence, but how does this stuff relate to um, our ABA dimensions, right? The dimensions of ABA. And I, I know that there's a little controversy there as ever, and that's fine. And that not all great um, work and certainly not all new research or, or new ideas will have a relationship to every single one that will be clear cut and answerable from the very beginning. But the paper does try to address a couple of things really clearly, like the applied significance of it, you know, um, the relationship to its conceptual foundation, it being rooted firmly there in the science. Well, the idea of active nurturance, the idea of operationalizing this idea of the buffers, it comes down to making sure we can do this in a way that's conceptually systematic. And when we're implementing the buffers, I find that there's usually a great set of reasons that the person is not already there. They're facing barriers. They're facing these huge barriers, right? Um, in my case, a lot of the barriers were solved when I started looking at them systematically but I think that's my lens of, of knowing, okay, this is how I'm going to solve my problem. And I started trying to look for caregivers and for clients. What buffers are they able to do and why aren't they able to do them? When I did that, I kind of got these groups of different barriers. Like, wow, they have all the resources they need, but they have no social support. Or, you know, they, they have no money to do these kinds of things. They, they can't take a bus to get to that part of town where the wonderful um, nurturing healthy food is available for them to pick up for free. And I'm on groups all the time where somebody is asking for help with something that might seem so trivial. And you think, wow, that is a barrier for them. If everybody knew about the other barriers people face, we could come together and solve some of these barriers, right? So that's what I'm trying to do is just the tool, the butterflies tool, butterflies, it's an acronym I'll share. And we're just trying to target them in conceptually systematic ways that are pragmatic for us. So I think before Stokes and Bayer, you know, and this is maybe a good uh, parallel, we behavior analysts, our community, we might not have all thought about the need to systematically prom towards generalization, right? Some of us were doing it. Some of us weren't. Sometimes we had great means of doing it. Sometimes we train and hope. And I didn't want that to happen with buffers and especially with the barriers people face. You know, if we take, and I'm going to quote, um, very loosely quote, um, Denisha Jingles, we, we just had her at the Bay Path Trauma Conference. And I don't have the quote in front of me. So I please forgive me, Denisha, if this is sort of butchering it a little bit. But she talked about how when we take a colorblind approach, and I think she's actually quoting from um, another article too, when we take a colorblind approach, we might be missing some of the big individual differences that make people, you know, so different. Um, we can't take a colorblind approach necessarily with th things like buffers. If somebody from your, in your company is disproportionately affected by a market difference in how they can access the buffers, don't you think we need to kind of level out that playing field? You know, don't you think we need to make sure they all, everybody, we all have access to solving these buffers? And so the tool is trying to help people see that all of these different barriers folks face, we, we should probably look at each one of them and make sure that we're not missing something huge. Um, so butterflies, 
It stands for looking at the person's behavior plan to see if there's intersection, intersections there. Um, are there triggers and difficulties? That's what the T stands for. Does the person have the intact repertoires and relationship issues they need? Um, are there issues with their fluency and their behavior stream? Um, L is for learning new skills and S is for scanning periodically. Now, when I do a scan on myself and I look at the buffers and I look at barriers, it's not the same two months later. It's really different. I find that, oh, now I'm really focused on exercise and nutrition, but you know what? My, my primary relationship with my partner is really suffering now and it wasn't two months ago. What do I need to do to get that kind of back into alignment? And so just looking at something systematically over maybe every three months, I kind of look at this um, with my own self. It reminds us that these are always important and we might need to kind of restructure things. When things change, we might need to tap into one of those buffers or solve a new barrier that happened now. And so the buff, the butterflies, that little tool is it's published in there um, in the article. There's a set of um, commentary that kind of goes through each section, gives some ideas about how to use it, how it can prompt a behavior analyst to meaningful conversations with our clients and their caregivers and maybe the staff at an organization that's going to help them be a little bit more systematic in how we address this. Because again, kind of like generalization, if we just hope this is done, you know, it's, it's not anyone else's job. You know, it may sound simple, it is, but it's not that easy. And yet it can be done in a systematic way. Got it. And uh, I'll make sure that uh, people can, if you go to behavioralobservations.com and check out the show notes to this episode, um, uh, if the uh, if the right permissions are uh, obtained, we can put a picture of the, the, the tool there or get people links to it. Um, but one way or another, we'll, we'll, for people who are interested in checking this out, uh, just go to the show notes to this page and we'll point you in the right direction. And uh, we want to give you the visual to go along with with that description. So sure, um, and it's open access. The whole oh, article. it is okay. All right, then I'll just yeah. yeah, I'll take a screenshot of it and I'll put it in the uh, show notes of the of the of the page and and link the original source. So that's fantastic, and uh, that's yeah. great that that is uh that, that was made open access. So, um, I want to switch gears real quick, uh, and talk about. Um, another piece that you drew my attention to your recent article in operants. Uh, <laughs> and I did not get a chance to be confession time here. I didn't get a chance to read it as closely as I would have liked before uh, we met today. But I have to say, I was struck by a couple of quotes here. Uh, and I'd like to get your reactions to the reactions to your own writing, I guess, or at least some, some <laughs> you know, some of the nuance that went, or some of the thinking that went behind uh, wh why you chose to phrase things this way. Cause I just thought these quotes were just, just fantastic. So uh, it, in one section of the paper, you write uh, offering choices might be a staple in the repertoire of a behavior technician excited to incorporate choices for all clients, but for some clients experiencing a vocal choice from an RBT might constitute a surrogate condition motivating operation in the presence of which rapid onset of escape behavior is highly likely. Choices can be employed strategically to reduce behavior labeled as quote unquote challenging, yet could also be experienced as punishing or manipulative. When I read that, I was just like, whoa, that's deep. <laughs> so uh, if you can maybe elaborate on that. Uh, I'd love to hear your thinking behind how you, uh, you know, the, the idea behind behind this, this really remarkable quote. Sure, oh, thank you so much. That's very kind. Um, I, I should first say just a, a big thank you because Operance Magazine is so cool. And I, I do have the issue or my, my article on it up on my website, but it's not an issue you can see unless you, subscribe to Operants Magazine, which is part of the B.F. Skinner Foundation. And it's so neat. And um, Alice uh, Schillings, Schillingsberger? Um, Schillingsberg, yep. Schillingsberg, thank you. Yeah, uh, she edited this, this issue on control and choice. And there are so many cool pieces in there. Um, I mean, the author list is 
it's, it's like, it's so humbling to be on that same page with that table of contents. It really is. Um, and at the same time, I was really humbled to be asked by Andy Latall and Eddie Fernandez, who are the guest editors of that issue, and both have really cool things to say. I always love Andy's work on schedules, and Eddie and I are friends from grad school, and he's doing amazing work with animals, you know? So it was just really neat to be part of that experience. Now, the quote that you mentioned, that's funny because it was almost said to me in ver uh, verbatim, and I translated it by somebody who had autism a long time ago. They said, you know what, Camille? <laughs> People just come up to me and offer me choices between things I don't like. And like, that's supposed to make me want to like them. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that for a long time. We were in a mental health institution down in Denver. And I thought about what they were saying and just the profound implications that we all want to give choices, right? Hey, do you want the green one or the blue one? And so often we do that because we have an agenda. We're just trying to get behavioral momentum. And I find myself doing it with my kids. I'm um, almost like it's second nature. And I have to check myself and going, hey, am I, am I giving a choice? Not because I even care what my kid thinks. Am I just trying to get them to engage in choice making right now because it's a tool, because it's utilitarian and I want them to do something for me. <laughs> I, I've sometimes thought about that as the illusion of choice. Yes. <laughs> so, like, yes. Um, like, do you want to actually... do, do you want to do this uh, worksheet with a pencil or a pen? Like right. I really you know, like, I, <laughs> I, I want the worksheet done, though. That's the bottom line. You know? Yes. Like I have an agenda and I know behaviorally of several ways to manipulate you, honestly, to manipulate you into uh, making a quote unquote choice that's going to be used to get you moving on <laughs> in the path I want. <laughs> and truly, there are some great articles um, surrounding mine, like Joe Lang has a good one. Um, did you... Rajamaran has one in there too about sort of these issues, right? Mm. But yeah, I, I think that's what it's all about is that you don't know the history that someone has with respect to the options. Sure, we know that, but you don't know the history they have with respect to the procedure of choice making too. You know, the conditions under which they've been exposed to choices or maybe not ever asked what they really think, just given choices between two options that aren't even appetitive to them. Or maybe one of the options has a history with respect to punishment. And you may never know why they don't choose that wonderful thing you think is amazing. So yeah, there, there's so many neat things that I got to explore and remember in that paper. And I kind of tried to do it from that parent perspective. And um, it was fun. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, uh, that, that, and that it came from a, an interaction you had with someone who experienced that is it makes it all, all the more um, salient here. Um, and, and then another, and this, I guess a segue into like the last uh, couple of questions I have for you here. Uh, and, and, and maybe it's just because I'm going to be 50 in a few months. I find myself in these kind of, uh, you know, old man yelling at clouds <laughs> moments. Um, but uh, uh, you know, you, you have this quote here that, that I, when I read it, like, she must be writing that just for me. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, it says, a procedure contraindicated for one client may be used ethically to produce socially valid outcomes for another. And I, I again, I just thought that was a really powerful statement, especially in the context of where we are right now, where so much of what you see, you know, particularly in social media, you know, there's all these uh you know you know uh for lack of a better term arbitrary rules that are you know people are putting in these nice you know they're writing them in these nice little canvas squares and yeah you know, it's you know like don't do this do that you know or you know and um they and, and i think the degree to which they're they're more uh rigid and less less uh you know i guess uh stated with nuance the more they they I guess, irritate me, if you will. Uh, and so I found this quote, you know, um, uh, quite, quite validating. So, um, I, I, and again, I don't, um, I, I don't know if there's any more commentary that you want to uh, throw at that, but uh, I, I, uh, I just wanted to share my, you know, how, how that struck me. So, 
thought that was very, yeah. very good. I mean, I like Canva. <laughs> I, I just discovered it. I, I'm one of those really old to Instagram people who got on it to try to chat, chat with people, try to connect with my audience and in a new way, because I am so quote an old in the field, you know, I'm, I'm pushing 46 here and, uh, I, I got in trouble my first day or so on Instagram. Do you know this story? No, I'm, I make sourdough and I thought I'm going to, I'm going to hashtag myself the sour doc, right? Because I'm a doctor and I make sourdough. It's hilarious. And about an Sounds hour later, my, my babysitter's in there. Um, we only had her like once. So this is just serendipity that she was even there. She's 17. And uh, I came in running and crying. And I said, I said, Kira, Kira. I accidentally hashtag this. Uh, apparently, it's a marijuana strain. Sour Doc. I thought it was cool. <laughs> oh, no. I said, how do I remove this this hashtag? I am in trouble. Fortunately, I had like one follower. I'm sure they didn't care. She told me how to remove the hashtag. I was way more careful. Oh, um, boy. It, That's funny. Yeah, in Instagram. It's, it's been a whole thing. And Your sometimes Instagram I do. feed is very, very, uh, <laughs> by the way, that the, is very, uh, very cool. I've, I've enjoyed following it and you do post a lot of uh, really nice oh, stuff. Uh, and I am a, a Canva user. I'm, I have a Canva pro account. Uh, so I'm not, nice, nice. I'm not, uh, I'm not <laughs> opposed to Canva per se. I, you know, I just see all these like, uh, you know, kind of like should statements that, uh, you know, totally. uh, or thou, th thou shalt this, that, and the other thing. And yes, um, and I, I, and I, I get I, that. I've got a little bit of, uh, you know, <laughs> a, um, a oppositional streak in me. So I, I don't know, for some reason, it just, you know, because when someone says don't do that, it, it's, it gets to that under what conditions, uh, you, know, uh, fr you know, framing that we were talking about before we hit the record button, you know, about like, well, I, I bet I could, I bet I could think of a condition under which, you know, the, the whatever prohibited thing, mm -hmm that 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 uh people are talking about today would might possibly be helpful for an individual but i i don't want to belabor the point i guess the last oh, thing oh no I'll, I'll, no that's I'll... okay that's okay i think the point about contraindicated procedures that's a point i've been trying to make for years right because i'm, I'm so often asked what procedures are contraindicated for trauma and it came up in that choice and control article because the answer is it baby, it's an individualized question, just like anything. Um, it depends. It depends on on what the values are, what the client needs, the individual history with respect to the alternatives you're offering. It will always, almost, I will say almost, it will almost always depend. Um, what's contraindicated, again, for one person might be ethical and appropriate and assent based and important to someone else. Indeed, indeed. And, you know, and I should just, you know, I guess, uh, step back for a moment, and just acknowledge that, you know, these concerns are coming from uh, the, I, you know, largely from the intention to reduce harm. So I'm not saying yes. that the, the motives, I'm not questioning the motives or anything like that. So I should uh, just make sure I, I state that for clarity purposes. So, um, but I guess the, 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 final question I have here is kind of related on the same theme is that, uh, you know, what, um, w widening the conversation about trauma, you know, in just a few short years, you know, trauma has become kind of like a household term, not just in behavior analysis, uh, but in the culture, I think also. And, um, uh, but within behavior analysis, many providers are, you know, using these terms in their marketing materials mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, as well as other, other types of ABA descriptors and every once in a while, uh, uh, you know, kind of described this as hyphenated ABA, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and I think I sent you, uh, yeah, I sent you a, uh, I got, you know, how as a BCBA, we all get like a hundred job, you know, offers a week through the, you know, yeah. the automated system. Uh, <laughs> one came through looking for an ascent and trauma assumed BCBA. Uh, that, that was, that, that's the descriptor. Now I understand that this is again, it's probably coming from a very, very uh, good place. So and I'm, I'm not trying to dunk on anyone in particular. And, and I'm sure the person who wrote the job advertisement um, had, you know, has the best of intentions. Um, but <laughs> I just, I, I, I sometimes worry about uh, these sorts of um, the, I guess, a balkanization, if you will, of, of the field or, or tribalism, if you will. And like, oh, you know, um, 
you know, uh, these, you know, people are incorporating these, 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 these uh, uh, terms into their, their marketing materials. They put it on their websites and things like that. Uh, and um, I don't know. I, I'm just curious what your, what your thoughts are on these. My, I guess from my perspective, I, I, I worry that this can be confusing to consumers uh, certainly. And then at the same time, this, not much. I don't. I don't believe to to be in the way of standardization of what, you know, what is an ascent and trauma assumed BCBA, you know, uh, or any other type of you know, uh, so such and such affirming BCBA. You know, uh, what what does that mean? And I I think that's um, I, I you've been working in the in the in this you know kind of trauma area, and I think you're probably the go to resource or expert um uh along with probably uh, you know the aforementioned uh dr Raja Raman uh in the field but i'm just curious what your broader perspective is on on how these terms have developed such a prominence uh in, in our in our and how we talk about these things how we market ourselves how we put what our forward facing i guess uh media are to the broader public well you know i there's great harm in the one sense of attaching some word to an approach anytime you do it, because that then opens up people who don't have the approach to call themselves the word and to get taken in. Um, there's some repackaging going on for people who want to be more accepted so they can rebrand themselves in this way. And all of a sudden, they get a new clientele, right, or new followers, and and I think that's very dangerous. Um, but that also that's a feat. It's sort of a feature, not a bug necessarily. It's just part of I think language. I, th I think it's part of how we language about all these terms. Um, the reason I called it Tiba originally, like uh, twelve years ago, when I started blogging about this, was to connect with people people who knew about trauma and knew that the behavior analysis they received before didn't feel good to them. And I wanted them to know that I was going to listen to their individualized needs. And I tried to make T-charts of what you might have experienced with behavior analysis and how if it were nuanced and appreciative of their individualized histories, what it would really look like. And so as you know, and as I hope a lot of listeners know, that doesn't make it trauma-informed or make it any different or make it not behavior analytic. It just is a new name that people could see and say, oh, okay, she's going to listen. And so on the one hand, I feel great responsibility for putting that idea out there. You know, I, I don't think I'd seen it in writing before I thought about it. And it's a reason, too, that several years later, I wrote why trauma-informed behavior analysis is redundant and why I do it and say it anyway. Right, right. right. I was going to mention that. It's like one of your yeah. most, probably most well-known uh, blog posts. Yeah, for sure. Could be. So I, I do think there's some harm. There's some good. Um, it's always worth exploring what the practitioners really do and asking them questions. So what would you do with this problem? You know, um, how do you document? behavioral histories in a learner? What tools do you use and how do you differentiate your practices? That means so much more than what they call themselves. Um, I will say, and I really hope that people listening have noticed, I didn't use the word trauma this whole time. I didn't use it until your question. Right. And it's very specific and on purpose of me. I, I want people to know this idea of using preventive behavior analytic techniques, maybe using a buffers and barriers approach to prevention is not about trauma. It doesn't matter if your client has a diagnosis. It doesn't matter if you can define trauma or not. Um, it doesn't matter if you've been trained to diagnose trauma. It really doesn't matter. And that's because this whole approach is predicated not on trauma, right? Not on a diagnosis or anything like that, just on biology, just on this idea that when we're exposed to uncontrollable stressors, challenging things happen in our biology, these things are lifelong, they're dose respondent, and there's something we can do about it with the behavioral environments that we engineer every day. 
I think that's the podcast right there. <laughs> <In a nutshell. laughs> uh, Camille, if people want to learn more about you, your trainings, everything, uh, where should they go? Well, um, as always, there's two pieces. There's a cuspemergence.com, which is a blog. Now, I do have a resources tab on that blog, and you can get a lot of the articles that I've referenced today, um, tools, different different ideas. But if you're interested in CE user training, that's the cuspemergenceuniversity.com. Um, one thing I've challenged myself to do recently, Matt, is to try to make a consumable, my mom or dad, my grandma can listen to this and understand it version of whatever I'm doing now. And so if you go to Cusp Emergence University, there is a little a little course called the Buffer Story. Um, maybe something like lessons we knew and almost forgot or something like that, the Buffer Story. And it's free. So it's like a little 15 minute video where you can also get all the resources free um, after you watch that video. So um, I usually try to also say, you can sign up to get emails. There's like a little tab on the Cusp Emergence University blog if you want to be on that list for when we have new courses. Because this this whole idea, you know, as I mentioned a couple of times, it's simple, it's not easy, but it's very, very helpful. And as we do it with co um, companies, there's this whole neat systems approach idea that comes in. As we do it with caregivers, there's a different set of things we need to know, right? Um, there's this whole idea of how it intersects with the ABA dimensions. And so each of those is coming with its own little um, explanation and like an hour long um, training that you can use to learn more. And how does it apply to behavior plans? You know, this age of client, that age of client. Um, I will say for a second, almost nobody is that familiar with dementia work or um, the great stuff we could do in elder care. And these buffers are just as applicable, if not more so, um, in, in that time of life too. And they're applied a little differently. And often we end up working on, you know, for example, in mental health, it's not so much that we're doing things, but it's we're reinforcing the memories folks have and the wonderful relationships they remember. And we, we kind of apply it differently, but in a way that seems um, valuable to, to those folks. So. There, there's all different kinds of trainings on the, the websites I mentioned. You could also follow me for more gaffes on, on Instagram. It's just at Cusp Emergence there. Awesome. We'll have the links to all of those in the show notes of this episode. Uh, and uh, if you're not signed up for the Behavioral Observations uh, mailing list, I send out the show notes to every episode. So you can go to the website, sign up for the mailing list that is 100% non-spammy. Nice. And uh, <laughs> I send all the show notes to every episode out to all um, all the subscribers. So you don't even have to go to the website. So uh, and you can learn all about cusp emergence as uh, 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 while you're at it. So, uh, Camille, it's been great fun. I learned so much when you uh, come on the show. Thanks for visiting with us again. Thank you so much for having me and valuing this information. I so appreciate you. <laughs>